Yeah, my name is Richard Zimler. I was born in New York in 1956, and I've lived in Portugal for the last 27 years. I studied comparative religion at university, at Duke University. Later, I studied journalism at Stanford. And um, then I started writing novels. And um, about the same time, I moved to Portugal. Um, I got lucky because my first novel, The Last Cabalist of Lisbon, became a huge hit in many countries and has now been translated into 23 different languages. And since that time, that book came out in 1996, since that time I've written 10 other novels. So I live here in Portugal, I write my books, I cook my dinners, I crochet occasionally, and I participate politically in the development of the country, and I'm very happy to be here. Yeah, Richard, what triggered you? to investigate, start to investigating this uh, subject? I'm not a religious Jew, so you know, uh, I'm culturally Jewish. I grew up in a Jewish neighborhood. My parents spoke Yiddish and English, of course. Um, but I grew up thinking, curiously enough, that Judaism was passé. Because what I knew about Judaism was bar mitzvahs, you know, and the bigger, splashier, better bar mitzvah that you can make for your kid or bat mitzvah for your, for your daughter, the better. And I thought that was kind of passe and not very interesting. So I studied uh, comparative religion at university at Duke because I was interested in Hinduism, Buddhism, Sufism, everything but Judaism. But then I read the Old Testament. And later, on my mother's bookshelves, and my mother was a fantastic reader, she read everything. And thank goodness I discovered, I thank my mother every day, I discovered on my mother's bookshelves Gershom Shalom the great specialist in Kabbalah, who rediscovered, almost single-handedly, this amazing medieval tradition that most rabbis thought was dangerous and crazy. And so I discovered the Torah, the Old Testament, and Kabbalah, and it blew my mind, as we say in the 60s. It opened me up to Jewish mythology. And it's always mythology that's interested me. Greek mythology, Norse mythology, I love it. And suddenly, there was this huge compendium of Jewish mythology. Because Kabbalah, even Kabbalah people don't talk about it, but that's what Kabbalah in part is. They talk about angels. They talk about demons. They talk about Jewish demons. They talk about non-Jewish demons. They talk about Lilith. They talk about Asmodeus. They talk about other dimensions, spheres that were broken and have to be put together through Tikkun. They talk about everything. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. And so I started studying Kabbalah. And then, and why did I start studying Kabbalah? Because of my first project, The Last Kabbalist to Lisbon. I discovered the Lisbon Massacre. And while I was doing research on the book, I discovered Gershom Shalom. And I thought, wow, I can make my main characters manuscript illuminators and Kabbalists. About the last Kabbalist of, of Lisbon, you started your book with an author's note. Yes. And I, I found myself constantly wondering, was it part of the fiction or was right. it true? Yeah, in the beginning of that book, actually I'll start a different way. My agent warned me that you're writing about Portugal in 1506, and that's a long time ago for a lot of people. So you have to find a way to bring the reader back to 1506 quickly, because people don't have long attention spans anymore, as we know. So I came up with this idea of uh, talking about manuscripts that I discovered in Istanbul that lead me on a journey back to 1506 to a Kabbalist named Berakai Azarko, who lived in Lisbon at that time and who suffered through the Lisbon Massacre of 1506, which was a massacre in which 2,000 converted Jews were murdered and burnt in the main square in Lisbon, and the main square is still here. Um, so that's why I decided to invent these manuscripts written by Berakai Azarko and how I discovered them in Istanbul. I used my experiences actually living in Paris in 1982 as the template for this house I lived in, in, um, 
in Istanbul because I lived in a place lent to me by a friend where the ceiling was only about eight feet tall. It hadn't been fixed since about 1920. There was no shower, no bathroom. Um, so I used that as, as where I lived in Istanbul when I discovered these manuscripts buried in the basement. But you, there are no manuscripts. It's you know, I feel real guilty about this because readers write to me from the States, from Brazil, from Israel, from all over the world saying, where can we find these manuscripts? And I feel terribly guilty because I have to explain at that point that they're only, they only exist in my mind. Um, and I apologize. But then they usually reply back saying, well, don't apologize. It was a great way of getting us into the story of Berakai Zerko and his family. Okay, but in terms of research, yeah. when you wrote the book, yeah. you had researched it seriously. Oh, I'm a professional. I don't like to get details wrong. You know, I read historical novels in which there are just so many dates, people, events, the way people think, the way people dress, it's all wrong and I can't stand it, I can't bear it. Um, in part because to convince the reader that your people, your characters exist, you have to get the details right, even if they think they're wrong. Occasionally they'll write me and say, you know, this wasn't the way people were and I have to correct them and explain that I did the research and why they're not correct. Um, and I'll give you a specific example of that in a minute. But yes, to write the Lesque Balls to Lisbon, I read about 40 books. There was no one single book about daily life in Portugal in 1506. So what I did is I bought books about clothing, about the way the houses were built, what people ate. You know, I found cook, an old Spanish cookbook from the 17th century. And then I tried to put it all together to create my characters because I'm a character-driven author. The plot is important, of course, and the quality of writing has become ever more important to me to develop believable, wonderful, fascinating, or horrible characters. A specific example is when I was doing the research for The Last of Austin, Elizabeth, I discovered that medieval Haggadahs, we say Haggadahs in New York, people in, I sometimes say Haggadahs, and I don't know what the correct pronunciation is. But in any way, the book that tells the story of the Exodus that we use, that we recite, we talk about on Passover, um, you would think that all the illustrations, all the medieval illuminations would be the story of the Exodus, but that's not true. If you go back and look at the Golden Haggadah, the Sarajevo Haggadah, and many other medieval manuscripts, you will dis discover that there are illustrations of Adam and Eve of Noah and his ark. So it's counterintuitive to the modern mind. So occasionally, and in my book, for a very specific reason, one of the manuscript illuminators tells the story of Haman from the book of Esther. And I still get emails to this day, one every about six months, saying, oh Richard, you're wrong. You know, the Haggadah doesn't have, you know, the story of Esther and it's impossible. And so I have to write back and say, take a look at medieval Ghana and you will discover that actually I'm correct. Another example would be, um, you know, the prayer of Esther became extremely important for the converted Jews. Why? Because Esther had to hide her Judaism. So she was a precedent. She was the way that the Maranos is a bad word for converted Jews, but the Anusim, the force, people forced to convert, new Christians, the conversos, she was proof to them that it was okay to wear a mask in public and hide their Judaism. So although the book of Esther is not considered one of the most important books and her prayer is not considered essential to Judaism, that prayer became paramount to the converted Jews of Portugal and Spain.